Wait. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, uh, Dina Powell is uh, head of global corporate engagement at Goldman Sachs. Um, she's been there for about two and a half years. She has uh, a distinguished career already in public sector work. Um, not quite another three seconds. That's what we're, we're doing for her. And instead of, uh, of working with her to home in on one particular subject, uh, I asked uh, uh, to give us an overview of how she got where she got, what she's working on, uh, what the key you know, levers to push, and what the issues are. And I think you'll hear the presentation be very exciting. Um, and then we'll have Q&A. We'll go into it and see what we take. So we're on. Um, I think one of yes. we can do a quickie round the table. Um, I don't know. I didn't see where you're from, so. I, uh, I'm a thought project, so I'm used to be that. Sarah Rosenberg, first year MPP. Paul S. Forms, MPP, JD, Kenneth. Alaka Jordan, Duke Divinity School and the Center for Reconciliation. Nancy Bernstein, International Strategy for Duke University. Anita Shirley, Foundation Relations at Medical Center. Ronnie Chatterjee, Duke School of Business. Sean Smith, second year MPP. Amanda Gregg, first year PhD. Joel Huber, Business School. Paul Bloom, I'm with the Center for the Advancement of Social Services uh, over in Cuba. Uh, Patrick Sable, I'm a first year MPP. And then introduction is a MPP. Jessica Lawson, I'm a second year MPP. Marjorie Patterson, second year MPP. Jasmine John Jai, second year MPP. Justin Oliver, second year MPP. Wendy? Wendy Curran, I work with Cuba. Uh, I'm Vanessa Land. I'm a first-year master's student at New School of the Environment. Mm -hmm. I'm Sarah Burdick, who is the first strategic plan for the civil society. Peter Garrett, first-year master's public policy. Allie Gusford, I work in the Center for Child and Family Policy. Rachel Ann Atkinson, who has been her first. Frank DiSilvestro, part of the leadership program here at Duke. Melinda Lawrence, North Carolina Justice Center. And Christian Goss, I'm a faculty here. Are we done? We're done. Table. All right. Well, thank you, Ed. Um, I am. I know a couple of you. I'm so honored. Um, were with us early in the class. So I'm gonna have to mix it up a little, right? <laughs> I don't think so. I think uh, no, a little bit, but not much. A little bit. Well, first of all, I'm really honored to be here, and I, I know we had to change the time, and I really appreciate knowing how incredibly busy all of you are, uh, especially our students uh, here are so so busy. So thank you for taking. Um, you know, Ed is overly generous in his nice introduction. It really has been a privilege over the last uh, two and a half years, uh, almost two and a half years, uh, the work that I've done at Goldman, and I'll tell you a little bit about how it got there. Um, but uh, frankly, um, I'm sitting by two extraordinarily distinguished gentlemen, and one of them uh, has had a, a you know public and private sector experience as well, and um, really understands. Uh, I hope, and, I, and we were talking about this the importance of that diversity. Of experience. So I hope I at least intrigue you all a little bit uh, to think about different times where you spend uh, in some of the uh, other uh, insti in, in uh, many institutions. Um, I also said this morning, but I but I really really believe that um, you know there will be an extraordinarily uh, amazing legacy and already is of Joel Fleischman. And you really can't do the kind of work certainly that I do or did in the government um, and not come upon uh, his, his legacy. And I described it this morning as, um, you know, literally wrote the book, <laughs> but, but more than that, um, built the leadership and the generations of leaders so far. Also, you know, everybody says, well, I, you know, Joel Fleischman taught me, or he taught me this important thing, whether it's a student or not. So it's such an honor to be here with you. I heard a funny story, though. I think it was Wendy who said that when Judy Woodruff gave you that extraordinary honor this year, last year, um, 
at the school's highest honor, um, that she said, well, if you stand up in the Raleigh-Durham airport, and you're over there, and she was, she was guessing, if she screamed, who knows Joel Fleischman, that, you know, 70% of the people would, would say, I do. Um, but I'm here to tell you that uh, with uh, Greg Dees and others that you all know, when I go to Davos or to Aspen or pretty much anywhere, I can stand up and say, you know, Joel Fleischman. So thank you. Thank you so much. Um, well, I, t this morning, and then at the case um, impact, net impact conference today, um, I really want to probably learn more, honestly, with some of the really interesting questions that I've heard from students and faculty and others, and I really hope that we get to that right away, the dialogue part, and I'm excited to hear what you all um, might think about some of the work that we're doing. Um, I um, spent 12 years in government, um, which is sort of extraordinary to think about. Um, I, I will uh, laugh because Ronnie and I were laughing about it, and I, and I told a couple of people earlier that I, the, um, I am an immigrant to this country, and my parents um, you know, really sacrificed so much to leave Cairo, Egypt, many, many years ago, and to take their two girls, they had a third girl um, later, uh, in Dallas, Texas, and we immigrated, and um, it was really extraordinary. I you know, um, didn't speak English, uh, uh, when I moved, I had a lot of cultural um, assimilation, I guess, to, to really do acclimation. And um, one of the things that I remember, besides obviously be, being very lucky that I had parents who worked really hard to make sure their girls um, got everything they needed, um, they were, you know, immigrant parents. And uh, they said, you know, Dina, um, we left our homeland so that you could pursue your dreams. You know, uh, the sky is the limit. As long as you're a lawyer, a doctor, or an engineer. <laughs> so, um, you know, I, I really do share that story on purpose because um, we all, whether it's immigrant parents or friends or colleagues or mentors or professors, sometimes, you know, understandably, we get a little bit boxed in. And it's hard to not go down that path and to be open minded to other experiences. And that's something I really learned. Um, because I did dutifully get into law school after college and after um, having worked full time in the state senate in Austin, Texas, and I, um, of course, wasn't even a question. I knew I knew um, doctor and engineer were going to work out for me, <laughs> but uh, lawyer, I was really excited and and thought that would be actually great. And I'd already thought about um, a lot of different ways to apply the, my legal background. Um, but when I got this call out of the blue to go work for a senator in Washington. I was really excited, and I thought, you know, I think I'll, I really want another experience. I'm just going to do this for a year, and then I'm going to come back uh, and go to law school. And telling the immigrant parents that <laughs> was not great. You know, I had to fax the deferral letter from the law school to prove they really would take me a year later. And um, I will never forget my really wonderful father saying, you know, if you really want to do this, but you know, politics is not a job. <laughs> so I really had to uh, fight some barriers. and. Um, I worked on Capitol Hill. I um, saw um, then, you know, what I what I sort of began to see a little bit in the state senate that young people had this enormous opportunity to make an impact in government. Uh, you know, working on legislation you care about, topics you care about, and I guess I caught more that bug necessarily than the political bug. It was the impact bug. You know, feeling like I could actually make an influence, tiny as it was, you know, for many years, but um, but one that I was proud of. So I spent what turned out that one year turned into 12. I worked on um, Capitol Hill and the White House, and most recently before joining Goldman, I was the Assistant Secretary of State for Public Diplomacy Programming. And um, that was a particularly um, uh, humbling you know, honor because um, the, 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 uh, what, what, what used to be, I really would rather not speak Arabic and eat Arabic food because I want to fit in in Dallas, Texas, turned into the greatest gift my parents gave me by making sure I retained my Arabic skills my cultural understanding of the region, which sadly did become pretty relevant after 9-11. And so when I worked uh, for Secretary Rice and uh, traveled around, um, that an instant connector in many, many ways, and also just an understanding. What I think was so compelling at the time um, is that we, we in, in that job, it's really the job of minds and hearts of, of people around the world. And it's a long-term struggle. I mean, it's not something you think, okay, in two years, people in Saudi Arabia or Pakistan or India will understand us better. It's really laying the groundwork for a generation, and that was it used to be called the U.S. Information Agency. Some of you may have heard of that. And Voice of America was an example of how do we communicate directly to people our values. 
Um, but what was interesting is that I increasingly on the team saw that women were truly extraordinary agents of peace. And in, in that context, as a government um, official, we were really in the midst of this battle for minds and hearts and looking for partners. And women were not only um, extraordinary in terms of economic empowerment and um, development, but they really were agents of peace because mothers care about the future. They care about what's happening to their sons and daughters. And peace for them means a better future and generation for their kids. So that was sort of a seed that was planted. And when I had the privilege of receiving the phone call from Goldman Sachs, uh, you know, I really had, and, and Joel can tell you, you know, um, I did, I'm not a banker. <laughs> I, I uh, didn't, uh, you know, uh, instantly recognize uh, what, why they had called. And what was so exciting for me was that at Goldman, there really had been generation after generation after generation of leaders who believed that public service was a very important value to the company. And whether it was John Whitehead, who um, ran the company and then started too many things to count, but certainly the social enterprise uh, program at Harvard, um, whether it was um, public service, many people who engaged in public service, um, and it was really in the ethos. And I, and I thought, you know, you're not really starting from scratch at a place that respects this a great deal, that has many examples of people, leaders who've invested, and now who were saying to me two things. One, we really are proud of what we've done over the last decade plus, particularly with the foundation of things, but we want to um, go take that, go to the next steps. And we think women are a really great investment. We noticed, you know, you've been doing a lot of women's programming. And I thought that was so interesting that uh, many of, I, there were men and women, of course, I spoke with, but many of the men said investing in the economic empowerment of women is a really good investment. And we see it. And they saw it because it's a very analytical place. And two pieces of research had emerged. One was called Womenomics, uh, written by our senior strategist in Asia, Kathy Matsui. And another was called Women Hold a Path to Sky, which found that uh, greater labor force participation by women, uh, particularly in the so-called BRICS and next 11 countries, led to GDP growth. And that was authored by a gentleman by the name of Jim O'Neill. I don't know if you all know that name, but he's actually the man who coined the phrase BRICS, Brazil, Russia, and India, China. So, in emerging uh, countries. And um, what, what really was interesting is these pieces of research made their way to our chairman's office and our chief of staff, and he, our chief of staff, John Rogers, and our CEO, Lloyd Langton, started to say, this is really compelling. It's, it's just, you know, more women being more fully part of the economic fabric in countries grows, you know, translates into growth. We, as, you know, a global corporation, particularly a financial kind of corporation, care about growth. And so there's something here. So it was about then uh, that they began to talk to a number of people about what was out there where we could make an impact. And business education emerged. And they recruited uh, me. And I had the great privilege of working with a number of people at the firm on where can we make a difference. Where, where you know, there was a lot of great work that had been done in microfinance that some of you may be familiar with and how the Eunice's work. There were small pro pro programs, very small, kind of at the other end of the spectrum of um, uh, much, uh, much well, more uh, wealthy individuals who were emerging, more women were emerging as business owners. But there was a big gap in the middle. And, a, and, and there was a, a lot of research that showed that women who were small and medium-sized enterprise owners that could be equipped with knowledge and mentors and networks and capital would make a huge difference in growing their business and job creation. So we talked to a lot of people. We talked to academic institutions who eventually became our partner. We work now with um, 30 uh, academic institutions globally, as well as now nearly that number of nonprofit organizations who much more smartly than we understood the cultural issues of each country. We recognized that we had some expertise to bring, had a convening power to bring people together, um, and our people who were unbelievably motiv motivated to participate but we needed partners who really understood the issues in each country. And that's why organizations like CARE, that Ginger is on the board of, um, are, were just so vital because they have had such a long history in the most difficult and challenging environments of empowering women and, and girls in, uh, throughout those countries. So I'll, I'll kind of fast forward here and tell you where we are and maybe share two stories because much better than me giving you facts and figures, I can just illustrate by giving you two stories about what's happened and 
who these extraordinary women are that we have the privilege to work with. Um, we are now um, working in 18 countries. The program is a certificate program, so it's a short-term pragmatic management uh, program. The basics, how do you open a bank account? How do you access capital? How do you manage people? How do you, um, uh, well actually this is funny, we, we do have the module, which we don't actually call this, but it's sort of called how do you fire your brother-in-law? <laughs> because we found that in so many countries, culturally, it's an affront to the family if you don't hire everybody in the family, even if they may, you know. Um, so they were, we were hearing a story about a woman who said, well, I can't find my brother-in-law, he's an accountant. And so they were asking her, well, is he really an accountant? And she said, no, no, but he's, you know, <laughs> but he knows how to add well, you know. So <laughs> this whole, that was sort of a, a very important thing. And, and how do you include the husbands in these discussions was something that CARE, Women for Women International, and many other organizations really want to speak through carefully. Um, we have been operating for nearly two years, and we work with a really outstanding organization called the Bridgespan Group. Do you all know Bridgespan? Uh, Tom Tierney and his team have helped us uh, build the metric and evaluation system by which we really guide this program. And we get, you know, we're, again, analytical numbers place where I work. And so they ask us a million questions. You know, how do you know, what are results? What does that mean? Who are the beneficiaries? Um, uh, okay, two years in, what's the progress? And so it's been really terrific to work with Bridgman and say, well, okay, this is, we did a sampling in four countries. Here's the growth, uh, the, the average growth, and, and we just learned actually, uh, nearly 80% of the women had increased growth. 55% um, had hired new people, and more than a third had access capital. So we, we um, really struck by that, and we were, and all of them, Attributing what they had learned in the program, you know, very specifically. Um, I didn't have a bank account, I used to put money in my bag. Um, I never had a business plan, so I couldn't get capital because I would walk in and they'd say to me at the bank, Well, you have to have a piece of paper. <laughs> so, you know, all these kinds of things, um, they were actually attributing back. Um, what's more inspirational is the social impact, is, is the leadership that you see. You know, Greg, do you know we're talking about how, um, in many ways, women entrepreneurs, particularly in the developing world, are definitionally social entrepreneurs because they are the core of that community. And so if they are better off, uh, <coughs> that whole community is better off. Their children are more educated. Their families are healthier. Again, and that's that return on the investment that is, is such a unique multiplier effect when it comes to women. So um, I'll share with you two stories and uh, maybe pause and take some questions or maybe go into a little bit of our domestic program. Um, you know, one of the lessons that we learned early is that um, not only is, is this target of 10,000 women important, because those are extraordinarily valuable and important lives and they have this multiplier effect, but investing in the capacity of educational institutions. So working with the School of Finance in Kigali, Rwanda, the American University in Afghanistan, um, that were uh, wonderful, wonder, are wonderful institutions, but don't have this specialty. And they don't tend to serve the kind of women that go through 10,000 women. So it's been a real partnership that's uh, really been exciting that we hope to leave behind is quite significant, more cases, better trained faculty. But one of the places we chose to work was particularly challenging, and it was at the American University of Afghanistan in Kabul. And you might say, what is Goldman Sachs doing with the program in Afghanistan? You certainly don't have an office there. And that was, uh, we, we were asked yeah. a question, <laughs> and um, you know, we really made the case that while an enormous percentage of 10,000 women would be, for instance, in the next 11 countries, that for a very incremental level of investment, you can have a huge impact in Sub-Saharan Africa, in Afghanistan, and places uh, like that, and in Ginger does that well. And what really struck us in Afghanistan is the fact that we were worried we wouldn't have a partner. We were worried we wouldn't have a, you know, an academic institution that would help build the program. But we didn't have to worry because uh, Angel Cabrera raised his hand. He's the president of uh, the dean, excuse me, of Thunderbird School of Management in Phoenix. He had already done some extraordinary work in Afghanistan for this program called Artemis, which actually brought women from <coughs> Afghanistan to Phoenix and trained them, and then they went back to uh, Afghanistan. But he said, I know it's much more challenging, but we'll work with you to create a program in the country. And so we worked together. And we actually had some of the Artemis lead students or um, leaders help us really formulate the program. And one of them was this just amazing woman whose name is Rangina Hamidi. 
and Rangina worked at, a, she owned a company called Kandahar Treasures, and she went around the most conservative provinces in Afghanistan, still Taliban-controlled areas where women can leave their homes, and she would go to these houses, take beautiful handicraft that the women had made, sell them, and then return the proceeds to the women. And Rangina um, was telling us a story about one woman in particular in Banyan, a very conservative province, uh, where a woman actually grabbed her hand after, uh, before Rangina left, and she said, you know, I've got to tell you a story. My husband um, is, is not easy, he's not an easy man, and he has never, ever really respected me in all the years that we've been married. And he's certainly never asked my opinion on any matter of importance, or any matter at all. And ever since I've been bringing in a little bit of income, he has started addressing me and asking me things, and he even recently asked me, whether or not we should send our three daughters to school. And of course, you know, I tell this story with a little bit of drama because it's really amazing. We were hanging on Rangina's every word. She was telling us this in person and, and we said, well, what happened? Did she say, please, please let my daughters go to school? And Rangina said, oh, she was so much smarter than that, than, she, than you all. Um, she actually <laughs> said to him, well, you know, these three girls are really not of much value. And what's gonna happen? is you're going to have to work so hard to provide three dowries for them to get married. And instead, if they go to school, they can support you. And the way that I've been able to bring in some income, they will bring in some income. <laughs> <laughs> and, so, and I always say, you know, this woman who was not literate, who had never gone a day of her life to school, was so smart in that moment. And sure enough, he looked at her and he said, you're right. I will force them to go to school. <laughs> I am so proud of that. 
whatever else happens. And, and it really is, you know, I think it says it all, that women uh, in this program have taught us that this pay it forward notion is one of the most important parts of it. Um, beyond the job creation and the growth, uh, there's something really special going on. And um, what I'd love to do now is show you a short video on the program so you can see some of the scholars and then we can take questions. That sounds all right. I thought I would get at this age. And 
at the end of the program, I see my mom totally equipped to take my business ten forward. Mm -hmm. The strangest thing is, uh, women in Egypt have been queens, but they haven't been business women. Queens <laughs> and entrepreneurs, they, they rise from the ashes, and they try to collect everything that's around them, but thinking not everybody has noticed, and trying to make something out of it. It's not, uh, it's not usually in hand. You have to have that feeling within, and the guts to you build something. Think of a woman in a developing country who is starting out and has enormous potential that our world desperately needs. Because of the investment in her education, the investment in her certificate, the investment in mentors, in the broader Goldman Sachs family, <coughs> and large numbers of established women leaders around the globe, she has every possibility to truly transform the world. Entrepreneurs innovate. They create value, and they generate opportunities for themselves, their families, and their countries. Through Goldman Sachs' 10,000 Women Initiative, we hope to do our small part to encourage more entrepreneurialism by focusing on business and management education for women around the world. I speak with some business language. I never knew what benchmarking was all about. <laughs> I never knew what strategy was all about. You know, but now, hey, check me out. <laughs> so when you do that, what happens then is that they're able to pull more people up. So, you know, it, it, it's a continuum. And, and for me, this is awesome. You know, it, it's a wonderful feeling. 10,000 is going to turn to 10 billion. <laughs>
We have a program that I meant to mention, in fact, earlier, which started 13 years ago called Community Teamworks, where everyone at the firm can take a day and work at a nonprofit. It's a paid day. And last year, our 13th season, we had 26,000 people participate globally. So we like to say from, you know, working in uh, schools in Bangalore to building houses in Boston to have a tap for humanity, people can select and we facilitate the whole day. But of course, being the slightly, um, uh, uh, let's just call it uh, direct and ambitious people that work uh, with me, uh, they don't just say, well, that was great, that was a day. They end up joining the board of that organization. They end up calling our office and saying, why don't we give them more money? What's our matching gift program? And so it becomes a much more um, important way to really engage the community organizations all over the world. So we house all these different initiatives in this office, and we look at it globally. We have global programs like 10,000 Women, but we have local programs to respect the, the needs in um, Beijing and Mumbai and Bangalore, as well as uh, in the UK and some beyond in Western Europe. Questions? Um, I'm curious about the decision to focus on uh, like business sort of postgraduate or mm -hmm. I guess graduate certificate type education. Um, I'm looking through the prospectus. Um, it's just it just seems like an interesting choice, and I wondered how because you know you often think okay, educating women, um, you know, in, in developing nations, you think primary education. Right. So I'm curious about the the focus on sort of this this. Um, managerial certificate, and then also, who are you targeting? Are you targeting sort of like a certain, okay, they have $5,000 in sales, or is there, there's a range of sort of businesses you're targeting, and, mm -hmm. and scope, and how do you make those decisions? Those are really important questions, good questions. Um, so, so a little more macro, how we even got to, you know, economic development or, and women and all, I kind of described the women part. Um, for 10 years, our the foundation had focused on inner city education, high potential at risk youth. And, and eight years ago, 10 years ago, uh, more than 12 years ago, um, it, you know, not a lot of people actually were investing in programs like Teach for America and Prep for Prep. And now, you guys, it's hard to believe that, right? But we were very proud to believe what we hope were one of many, by the way, but investors in what became super innovative ways to look at um, education. But um, you know, five years ago, a lot of people decided that was a good focus area. And the, you know, the Gates Foundation started spending $2 billion a year, and the government started really investing. And so we started to just say, gosh, our numbers are kind of drops in the bucket. Is there something we could do that would leverage more what our core assets are? Which I think is the, you know, is a really key question for corporations. So it really makes sense that Pepsi and Coke um, have really terrific water sanitation projects. I mean, they know what they're talking about when it comes to that. It really makes sense that Pfizer uh, and Merck are in, in, you know, investing in vaccines and antiretroviral drugs. What does it make sense for Goldman Sachs to do? Well, it turns out we know something about entrepreneurship. We know something about um, and, uh, business education, management education, and guess what? We have relationships with those schools. That's who we recruit from. That's, uh, you know, we, we have friends and uh, colleagues uh, that, that teach there. And so um, it was really first that, that issue, meaning there's a lot of social causes to support, but one, you gotta figure out what's your core strength so that your people can be involved. So they, they've seen pretty much most people at the firm, analyst to partner, have seen a business plan, you know, uh, understand what financing is. Um, so something your people understand, where you have relationships that can convene to make a difference and obviously um, using your resources as effectively as possible. And what we saw when we looked at a chance to um, invest in economic empowerment is there was just a big space. Uh, no one was investing in helping women around the world. And we now have a US program, which I can get to, but to really grow their enterprises. And it's management education, but I'll tell you the truth, it's really growth education, business growth education, meaning it's really pragmatic. It's the modules I described, it's short term. It's um, at night or on the weekends. It's only four months in one country in six months. So um, it's really meant to just say, what do you need? You already have the passion and the drive, which gets to your second question, Peter. It's, it's um, 
a portfolio approach, if you will. There are some startups, but very few. It's really a woman like Io, who already has a business, who has a couple of employees, but who can really turn this into something that's scaled in a much more significant way, create more jobs, and grow her revenue and invest in her community and become a leader. You know, the confidence piece of this is a pretty big piece of this. Just now, she's a different person now, too, and that's hugely impactful. So I think we looked around and we we, we asked the question, and in the, in the Harvard Business School case study, um, you may have seen it, we asked, well, what if we just wrote scholarships? You know, what if we found <coughs> MBA slots around the world? Well, the problem, number one, was those slots don't exist. So on the continent of Africa, 900 million people, 900 million, uh, there were 2,600 high-quality MBA slots for women. So first of all, you couldn't have even written a check if you wanted to. But then we realized also that not everybody needs to go for two years, um, spend you know $60,000, $70,000, um, and learn about derivatives. Don't tell my colleagues all the time. But you know, it's really much more pragmatic education um, skills and knowledge that, that we felt we could uh, make a difference. And that meant creating something new, which is, which is difficult. You know, it's, um, it was really bringing partners together, writing the curriculum, writing the, not us, but having the privilege of working with that's doing this work. Does that answer your question? Uh, this is fascinating. Thank you very much. And the scholar of gender, I'm really uh, intrigued by the premise and the promise of this uh, program. So um, I'm also a political scientist, so this is where my question is coming from. Um, it seems to me that whenever you empower one group, it can be threatening to another group that's currently holding the power, and certainly economic empowerment. Um, and I'm wondering, particularly in countries where you know, women may not have uh, the same status of rights that they enjoy in this country, for example, um, if you've had any concerns about, you know, a backlash, a political backlash with these programs, um, or, you know, in the case of Afghanistan, I know that a friend is a female social entrepreneur there, American, and she's terrified um, that her organization is going to be physically attacked. Mm -hmm. um, so I just wonder how you, um, you know, manage that kind of the threat that the, the, this very successful program might pose to sure. male political leaders, for example. Well, it's a very good question, and one we obviously have to think through really carefully if you want to work in places like Egypt and Afghanistan. Um, it, it, I can't stress enough um, how important it is to do this kind of work with global partners. You have credibility on the ground, you know. To be, uh, and we, we are a global company, but you know what, we're an American company. I mean, you know, we started in America, and so to be a company that comes in and tries to set something like that up, um, uh, I think would be very, would be unlawful if it, to do it on your own, and, and not very smart. Um, and even when I was at the State Department, you know, um, our government uh, works as much as we can with local respected officials, and many times it's the men first. You explain the marriage. And I'll tell you, I've learned a lot, again, from Helene Gale Keir and from Zainab Selby, Women for Women International, where Zainab works in the Congo and um, in some of the more brutal places for women to live. And the very first thing she does is she, she goes to the men in the villages and she makes the case that this is good for their village. It's good to empower women. Um, it makes it a better society. And, they're all, and, and frankly, she goes right down to the bottom line, you know, kind of like the woman in you're going to have more money. It's better for you. It's all about you. <laughs> you know? um, and so we, um, by working with academic institutions that are respected and local NGOs and local business leaders in every um, selection panel uh, for the 10,000 women scholars, we have local businessmen and women. So they're really invested and they protect the program. Uh, and you know, we see that. We really do. But the other big lesson is inviting the husbands. We always invite the husbands to the opening ceremonies, to the graduations. I, there was not a dry eye in the house. I was in Rwanda last July with our vice chairman because he was giving a commencement address at the graduation ceremony. And I mean, you look out and you, have any of you been to Rwanda? You know, um, it's my, it was my second time. And you know what's amazing is that when you go to Rwanda, the very first thing you need to do out of respect is go to the genocide museum, which um, I cannot even tell you about what that was like. And, and it, I think all of us have seen 
studied many atrocities, but there's something about an atrocity that happened in 1994, <laughs> I mean, you know, that's very recent and real. And to go through and to see the devastation on the country where people were hacked to death in a span of 100 days, um, it's just really overwhelming. So you don't expect to then be at a graduation ceremony where most of the victim, uh, excuse me, the participants were a, somehow a victim of the genocide. You don't live in Rwanda if you weren't. You didn't lose either all your family or some of your family. And to see the hopefulness and the forward looking and the aspiration, and then to see the family members dressed so nicely and so proud of these women who defied the odds, got through the program, are already applying it in real time and making a difference. And so um, I think um, you know, inviting and making sure they're part of it. And in countries like Rwanda, where you have a leader like President Paul Kagame, who decided, I, if I want to rebuild this country, women have to be part of it. They're, they're what I have left. <laughs> and they will make a unique difference. Well, addressing the other end of the gender issue is how it plays in the U.S. on this, that I know it care that you know, we believe that the way to make you know lasting impact on the underlying causes of poverty is to start with women to help them lift their communities up. But I am not in a meeting here in the U.S. where people sort of lose track of that and say, "But we feel sorry for the men, and we should address them." And I just wonder when you're yeah. talking with your colleagues mm -hmm. in the developed world how the gender issue is going there. You know, Ginger, that, that we get that a lot. And what I would say is that um, there's a couple of just really pragmatic answers. One, when you have a limited amount of resources, you have to try to make the investment that returns the most yield. <coughs> and when women just aren't part of society in the way they should be, in the percentages they should be, and I'm talking labor force and economic empowerment, uh, globally. So number one, there just was a gap, a major gap, but also, um, you know, study after study, if, if any of you haven't read, you really should read a book by Nicholas Kristof, the Pulitzer Prize winning New York Times reporter who wrote a book recently called Half the Sky. And it just talks very plainly. It doesn't mean men are bad guys. <laughs> but, but it means that, um, you know, women tend to reinvest those dollars in the community. And, um, I mean, you know, Nicholas cites the study where consistently, all around the world, um, the United States too, by the way, I mean, lo lower percentages here, but you know, men, um, excuse me, women invest the money that they make on educating their kids, providing health care, and supporting other ventures in the community. Men buy sodas, <laughs> spent literally down to sodas, mm -hmm. alcohol, and um, so, you know, uh, politely put. <laughs> um, and so, you know, you say, well, why? Well, guess who benefits the most in those communities? It's the, it's the boys. It's, it's not just the women, right? It's, it's the men and women, um, the children, uh, eventually. And that just is a next generational, more sustainable way to look at it. Um, now, I, I will also say that in the United States, we, we've launched a program called 10,000 Small Businesses, which has taken the model of 10,000 women and apply it through community colleges. Um, and we're just starting, uh, literally nine weeks ago, <coughs> and we're working with academic institutions to reach small business owners, and men and women in the United States, with a pragmatic uh, educational platform for capital and mentors and networks. Again, around the belief that small business growth is the best solution we have right now to job creation. Um, particularly, and, and this program is, is in uh, predominantly underserved communities in our country. And, um, it, interestingly, in this case, it's absolutely men and women. It just turns out when you talk to, uh, we were talking with the head of the SBA, Karen Mills, the head of the Small Business Administration, you know, it just happens that by a pretty significant percentage, more businesses are being started by women in the United States right now, small businesses, um, which, which is interesting. Now, success rates are not necessarily startups have a higher rate of failure, but I think that's very interesting. Well, it seems to me that your venture can have yet another add-on value because um, you're not depending on the public for funding this, whereas many nonprofits working in this area are having to make the case to the public. So the more you talk about it and make the case, the easier it is for people who are making this case to the public from a nonprofit standpoint looking for support. Well, I made a tweet 
told you about Helene said at a meeting when um, we were in Switzerland at a conference, and um, Helene Gale, who's the head of the USA, and she's an extraordinary leader, she actually said that um, while 10,000 women is a program, um, is great, and the women reached are going to make a difference in the platform, she said maybe the most important uh, legacy of this program is that um, uh, men who were bankers who look at black and white investments stood up and said, this was just smart economics. Um, not to, to take away from what the United Nations and the World Bank and the uh, organizations like here say, but her point was this was a very different voice in the debate, a very pragmatic voice, and that can itself be quite transformational when you think about investing in the world globally. As agents of change, or more importantly, as engines of economic growth, which everybody's looking for these days. Yes. Allegra? Uh, this is a wonderful program. It's so exciting to hear about all these signs of hope that you're finding and developing. And with so many of these stories, though, um, there's been great suffering that a number of them have, have had. And it, how do you, um, as uh, creating a financial program, uh, helping them with education, how, how do you help them attend to some of the suffering that they've, they've felt? I, I see that you give them some community through networking. You, you help them, but um, you're, it's amazing the, the hope that you're illuminating, but just how do you, you must have these real just gut-wrenching sessions that bring out some of the trauma that they face. Well, absolutely, um, although that's kind of the point of that story in Rwanda is that that's what I was expecting, you know? I mean, I was expecting to be sitting at the graduation dinner and having a lot of the women talk about how horrible their life had been. But they didn't want to talk about that. They wanted to talk about the future. <coughs> Let me tell you this new plot of land I'm going to buy. And I'm going to win that business plan competition next year. And I went and I told my husband that I had enough of him, you know, not giving me some of the money to buy something with and, and you know, more invest in our business. I told him he couldn't buy that. And, you know, it was so, it, what, it wasn't feel sorry for me at all. It was just, you know, in every case consistently, every place in the world that, that I've been, um, it's just all I needed was the skills. All I needed was the education. I'll do the rest. And, 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 and you know, that I, I know why you asked that, because I'm always shocked. I mean, I, I'll tell you my last story. Um, we worked with an organization um, called CanFed, which is a wonderful organization, small, that was started in the UK by a woman named Ann Cotton, that invests in uh, girls' school at Peace. And they work in rural Zambia and Zimbabwe. Um, trying to get girls into school. And you talk about, I mean, Peter's question, you know, I think literally 80% of people in rural Zambia don't read and write. And so girls are the very last to be worthy to be to go to school. I mean, they just know girls go to school. And so this just broke um, Anne's um, heart. Um, she had actually lost a daughter. You know, it's interesting, tragedy um, it channels uh, itself in a different way. She, she began her life's work. And so she, uh, started this program, and, and long story short, um, she got, over the last dozen years, thousands of girls through primary school, through secondary school, which is amazing, a smaller percentage. And then she came, she said, well, we need, we need to work with you on 10,000 women. And, you know, in our very focus, we had to say, well, as you know, we're women, and we're you know, and she said, no, 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 let me explain something to you. You have to care about this pipeline, number one. And secondly, your voice now is part of the thought leader, means you have to say that, um, School is important, but we have an if you finish secondary, there are other options for you. Because what she was finding is that girls who had somehow she had begged, stolen, borrowed to tell their dads, please keep them in school through primary school. We'll get the uniforms, we'll get the books. And somehow that percentage actually made it through high school. Just amazing. But they were saying to her when these girls were graduating, wait a minute, what's different? I could have married your mom. And you know, 14. I've had to feed her and clothe her and do all this all these years. What happened that you were supposed to, I was supposed to get something out of this in the end? And so Anne was saying, you've got to help us answer the what's next question for these amazing women who can be entrepreneurs, again, when they're in power. And, um, and she said, the risk here is that I have fathers telling me, well, I'm going to pull the 12-year-old out now, the 12-year-old sister, because I didn't see what ended up happening that was different with the 18-year-old. And you all can help us answer that. 
So we worked, and in this case, we went to work with Cambridge, the judge school, um, and it was Alison Richard, the vice chancellor there, who helped develop a program, who I'm sure you know, Kay, is extraordinary, and it was, it's an entrepreneurship program that is now taught in rural Zambia. One of the graduates, uh, a, an amazing young woman by the name of Penelope Chichi, had been orphaned at 14, uh, because both her parents died of AIDS. She became a prostitute. Um, she was really a lost person, and Anne found her and put her into school. She was so terrific that she became part of the alumni network now that Anne has. Got into 10,000 women in Zambia, graduated, and in this program, because it's quite unique to develop uh, something like this in rural Zambia, there's actually um, a business plan competition, and the, and the women get a, uh, a, a grant to start it. <coughs> um, Paolo started an IT training center. She had never even seen a computer a year and a half ago, and she now trains 200 women in rural Zambia on computer on IT center there. Um, you know, when you meet her, I had the privilege of meeting her um, because she got this big award last year, actually, um, in California, and um, she. And again, you read her story, you talk about it with your colleagues, and you sort of wait to think, how will it be to meet her? You, you, you cannot imagine. Of course, she will never lose the suffering and agony that she went through, uh, that she went through and you can never, no, that'll never go away. But she's all about the future, and she's all about the 200 women she's training, and she's all about how all the men are in the way, because they want to get into that training center, and she's only training women right now. <laughs> Um, I'd like to ask that this morning um, you talked, and again, I think the program is absolutely stunning, um, but you talked about expanding to 11 countries, and I'm really interested in the issue of replication, because a number of really great programs sort of floundered on the path to getting to scale. So I was interested in, as you think about expanding um, sort of to the next next stage, how do you, how do you preserve um, and attract the right leadership in those countries, how you preserve the quality of what you're doing, um, and the reputation, which obviously comes back right back to Goldman Sachs, as well as you know, mm -hmm. the long term. Um, the quality the control. Program, yeah. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, that's where the selection of who you work with is just so key. And we, we there are a lot, we're very, very honored and humbled by the interest of many, many institutions to work on this program, but we're really picky. We have to find institutions that are totally committed to quality because these are awfully important lives at stake and opportunities. Um, and so we really take the time to find the right partners. And, and I think on the question of scale, um, we thought 10,000 was certainly a, a large number, larger than anything else that had ever been out there. Um, but we never thought that was the end. Um, you know, we hoped that that could be the model and you could really test it through this geographic diversity, program model diversity globally, um, and then hope that not only would you continue, but you find other ways to scale. We're developing an e-learning uh, platform that we're starting to, to really invest in. We are looking at um, other countries, as, as I mentioned this morning, but ultimately, I mean, the greatest kind of source of pride came recently when we were with um, Ngozi Okwanjawa, the managing director of deputy of the World Bank, and she said, uh, she was in that video, she said, you know, 10,000 women, um, she told us this, um, is no longer a program. It needs to be a movement. And, um, you know, you all need to feel proud that you might have found something that's innovative that's working, but you need to make sure you're okay with other people coming in and investing and helping you scale it. And we said, we're more than okay with that. That would be really amazing. Um, so we're already really, I mean, it's been two years, so we need to confirm the results. We need to make sure that in some places it's needs to be, but um, you know, I think, we hope, there will be a way to really scale this program. Let me jump in and uh, pursue that a little bit. Um, lots of issues that you raise, uh, finding out of leadership, et cetera, et cetera, you seem uh, clearly to have handled, and it's growing in a nice way. Um, if one were to ask, okay, you tackled the tough ones and and those, what's the next one that you've got to tackle and that you think is, uh, is really important to get through in order to make it into a new world? What's the hardest problem you've really got now? That's a great question. Um, I would say a couple things. Um, how to more effectively use the people that want to be you know, we, we work with a couple of great partners on that, Ashoka and TechnoServe, and, um, you know, 
it's a great problem to have, honestly, that we have hundreds of people on a waiting list at the firm that want to be mentors and be on selection panels and guest lecture. And it's, it's a great problem, but you know, um, we we literally are creating now business plan review teams <laughs> so people can can be part of it. But you need to also make sure it's impactful and the woman is getting you know what she needs out of it. We've had um, one woman who's a fashion designer um, in IO's class in Nigeria was mentored by the chief of staff in our securities division in London. And uh, you know, this woman said, my gosh, I don't know anything about fashion, um, but I'd really like to, at the end of the day, after my day job of screaming at traders all day, I'd really like to see if I could make an impact and, and do something. On the other side, Tawafe Assisi, her mentee, said, looking at Michelle's resume, oh my god, the chief of staff in security, you know, what in the world am I going to be able to talk to this woman about? And sure enough, Michelle wrote her an email back on this iMentor platform that we used that said, um, none of us built these CVs on our own. We all had help. And I'm so honored to, to be a partner with you. And so um, how do we effectively channel? What I think a lot of companies you know, see, their people want to be so involved. Now, we luckily have a couple of programs now we can begin to channel. Uh, but there's even more of that to learn, to effectively <laughs> to learn. And TechnoServe. I don't know if you all know Bruce McNamee from TechnoServe, but really terrific. It's what they do, wraparound services, and we just um, are in the process of working with them on how do we kind of uh, deploy even in more of this talent. The second is capital. And um, here's a very frustrating fact that we learned along the way, is that if you look at um, developing countries, there's actually a lot of, supposedly, right, capital. Um, the World Bank has facilities. Oh, overseas private investment corporation. Most of the multilateral institutions are always saying, "I'm just we're trying to get this money out the door. We're looking for entrepreneurs." Um, but there's just some kind of breakdown. So Peter Van Coley, who will, you know, who's no shrinking violet, said to us, "I met with those people from the World Bank you asked me to meet with, and I told them, you know, mm -hmm. here's exactly what we need, and we need, and, and it's, by the way, in total defense of the World Bank, the whole reason they called and they said, listen, we've got." facilities and well, how do we get engaged and so they were on the right path but there's frustration out there that so many um, really worthy public or multilateral uh, uh, programs are out there but it's that